All right, we're going to go ahead and get started and just do the introductory portion while folks are still joining. So welcome, welcome. Um, I'm Emma Kelly. I'm the new, new economy field coordinator with Appalachian Voices. And we're going to do a round of introduction for the panelists first. So uh, Evelyn, I'll pass it over to you. Hello, I'm Evelyn Lee, Stakeholder Liaison with the Internal Revenue Service. I am located in Dallas, Texas, and I am happy to be here today to share some information, uh, an overview of information, and answer questions. Thank you, Emma. Thanks. And Richard? Good evening, everyone. My name is Richard Furlong. I am uh, Evelyn's colleague. I'm located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I'll be assisting with any IRS related questions you have towards the end of the meeting. And a big shout out to Emma for gathering us all uh, to participate this evening. We're looking forward to the dialogue. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Alfred, are you there? Can you introduce yourself? Maybe not. Uh, so Roger, I'll pass it on to you then. Thanks, Emma. My name is Roger Harwitz. I'm our director of Go Solar Programs at Solar United Neighbors. If you haven't heard of us, we're the uh, National Association of Homeowners with Solar Panels. We're very happy to partner once again with Appalachian Voices. All right. So we're so glad everyone could be here this evening. The original idea for this webinar was born out of a survey done by the Solar Work Group of Southwest Virginia. I will talk a little bit more about them later in this presentation. Um, but what we're hoping to do is give everybody some good information on a federal level about solar and clean energy incentives from the Inflation Reduction Act, and then also take a little bit more of a closer look at Virginia-specific solar opportunities and incentives. So we're going to start off handing the reins over to Roger, and then I'll take over and Evelyn and Richard can close us out with some IRA and IRS-specific content. And then we're going to have 30 minutes at the end for a detailed question and answer session. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat. We will be monitoring that and hopefully we can get through everybody's questions at the end. All right, Roger, it is all yours. And Jamie, we can go to the next slide. Thanks so much. Um, Solar United Neighbors is a vendor neutral national 501c3. We, we're a nonprofit. Go to the next slide there. And um, on this next slide, you'll, uh, you'll see our impact that, um, that we have had. Um, altogether, we are um, 13 states. The asterisk is that we're in 11 states, DC and Puerto Rico. Um, but we've helped over 8,000 families go solar um, through our solar co-ops and also by um, providing individual assistance. Um, that uh, ends up being, meaning 69 megawatts of solar installed. And just in the state of Virginia, um, over the years, we've been in Virginia, I think, for about seven years, and we've had 1,200 solar installations that we've helped with there, and 9.7 megawatts. Uh, next slide. And then our theory of change at Solar United Neighbors is we help people go solar. So we run solarized campaigns, which we call solar co-ops. We also provide individual assistance, and then we get people to join together. Um, for webinars like we're having right now and for solar happy hours and for solar conferences. And then we help organize people to fight for energy rights. And whether that is, um, you know, fighting, um, you know, for like the Virginia Clean Economy Act in Virginia that was passed in 2020, we've been involved in a lot of uh, those different fights, um, trying to help um, get, you know, shared solar, community solar in Virginia, and also um, help making better solar policies for the state. Um, okay, next slide. So I'm just going to go over the basics of solar. You, you may know this already, but when we talk about solar, um, we, we focus on solar PV. Solar thermal um, exists, but it's not, such, it's not so common anymore. So we're talking about converting solar energy into electricity. Next slide. And then you can see our solar panels here. When we talk about a panel, the, these are the different... Um, uh, different parts of a solar panel, the frame, the glass, the solar cells, which are what you think of as a solar panel. And then the term solar array, when I say that, that's going to mean a collection of panels next to each other, either on a roof or on a ground mount, like in this picture. Um, next slide, please. 
And then um, when we talk about solar, we're talking about kilowatts, like the when I was talking about our impact, um, a panel is measured in kilowatts, but actually it produces electricity in kilowatt hours, which is what your bill is in. And then we see on average that most homes end up installing a six to seven kilowatt system. Obviously some are much larger, some are much smaller. And really what we encourage is we want solar to work for everyone. So we encourage people to really talk with solar installers about their goals. Because for some people covering 100% of their usage is their goal. For other people, their goal is, hey, I have a strict budget and we want you to make sure that, it, um, that we're staying under that budget. Um, you can go to the next slide. This is just an illustration of how big a panel is versus a person. And then for a solar system, other than panels, we need to actually get that electricity and be able to use it. So um, for ground mounts and for a lot of commercial arrays, you'll see a string inverter, um, which is there on the left. And then micro inverters are very common in residential arrays because they're a little bit better for shading. And then there's a mix of the two, which is also really common. Uh, the most common brand for string inverters and optimizers is called Solar Edge. And they're I think, the, the biggest um, inverter company for residential installs around the country. And they take a string inverter and then put optimizers to help, um, to help each panel produce the, the uh, maximum amount that they can. And you can go to the next slide. And then of course there's racking and racking um, for a ground mount. Um, you know, is installed on the ground, but for most solar that we see for residential uses, it's on a roof. And obviously here's an asphalt shingle roof. You can go to the next slide. And then uh, this is actually my boss's roof in, in Washington, DC. And this is a standing seam metal roof. Um, standing seam metal roofs are awesome for solar because you don't actually need to make holes in the roof. They can just clamp it onto, onto the seams. But if you have a type of roof, no matter what type it is, someone has come up with a way to put solar panels on that type of roof. Uh, next slide, please. And then in terms of how solar connects to your electric panel, um, you know, all homes have different types of electric panels. All homes were built at different times. For most people, it's a pretty simple connection and they can put it into your electric panel. Uh, for some homes, you'll need an electric panel upgrade, but that's usually pretty rare. Also, there are different ways, like let's say your panel is full, there are different ways that they can actually connect the solar, it's called a line side tap, and that uh, doesn't actually go straight into your electric panel, because it goes into the side of your house, and that's another way that they can um, do it to you know, save, you, save you money rather than having to put in a whole new electric box. But also we see that like with the Inflation Reduction Act, there are all these incentives for, um, for heat pumps and for a lot of other cool technologies that use a lot of electricity. So we do see a lot of folks are taking the advantage of when they go solar, maybe upgrading their electric panel to be able to have room for all this new home electrification. Uh, next slide, please. And then a good roof for solar. Um, there, there are all different types of roofs that, that work, um, but generally south is best because we're in the Northern hemisphere, but east and west is fine too. And then the farther north you go in the US, north isn't as good, north facing. But the farther south you go, north is actually okay. So generally in most places, we're still not putting solar panels on a north facing roof, unless it's a pretty flat roof. Um, in, that, in that case, it could be totally fine. We're looking for little to no shading. And we, we need to make sure that there's enough space on a roof to mount solar panels. And also solar panels generally have a 25 year warranty in most solar systems and like micro inverters have a 25 year warranty. So generally, you don't want to have to take them off. Um, you can, but that's that's a that's an extra fee. Um, so generally, um, we're looking a great time to put on solar is after you've replaced your roof. Because if you think your roof is going to need to get replaced in five years or something, it may not make financial sense to put on solar panels because then you'll need to pay a hundred dollars a panel or whatever your installer is charging to take them off, store them while the new roof is being put on, and then put them back on uh, a couple of years uh, down the road. Uh, next slide, please. And then here you can see ground mounts. Ground mounts are really popular in rural areas. The great thing about a ground mount is that you don't need to put the panels on your roof. So you don't need to worry about roof replacement or anything like that. The bad thing about ground mounts is they take up a lot of space. They also tend to be a little bit more expensive just because they're more materials actually putting, um, you know, building that mount in the ground instead of the roof supporting it. And also one of the major costs of ground mounts is trenching. 
which is taking that those electrical wires and running them all the way to the house. So with ground mounts, people usually try and put them closer to homes um, so that you don't have to pay because it's usually a certain cost per foot for running the wires underground. Uh, next slide, please. And then when we talk about things um, in terms of solar technology, you'll see the slide used a lot, a lot of places. There's the solar array, which is the collection of panels, the inverter, which takes the energy, which is produced by solar panels, produce DC energy, and homes run on AC energy. So the inverter takes that energy and makes it usable so that you can run your appliances on it. And then your home will run on the solar energy. And then any um, extra energy goes through the electrical panel and back onto the grid. And then if you can go to the next slide, there will be a little bit more about that and about net metering. Net metering is still very common in most of the country. Um, and um, most of the investor-owned utilities um, in Virginia and around, around the country. Obviously, California um, has gotten rid of net metering. They're on net metering 3.0 already. But um, a lot of places, even if your state doesn't have net metering, um, it still is a good way to explain that some places have time of use, which means that their electricity is, has a different value at different times of the day. But net metering really tells you that you, know, you are going to be using your energy in your home or in a school or an office or nonprofit or anything. And then extra energy is going to be going back to the grid. So let's say you're, you, you're at work during the day, your house is not using a lot of energy and you're producing all this, all this electricity and then it's going back to the grid. And then for most people, you're getting credit at night because you come back from work, it's dark out, it's December, you turn on your lights, but you're getting a one-to-one -one bill credit most places. So that means that you are sending extra electricity to the grid during the day and then using it. So the grid is effectively acting like a big battery. Uh, next slide, please. And then this just explains it. And you can see um, this is like someone's production meter on the right about how much energy they're producing. And, it, and um, the thing with net metering is that most places um, you can roll it over month to month. So let's say you're producing a lot of um, extra electricity in April because it's sunny, but you haven't turned on your air conditioning yet. Um, you can ro roll over those credits to May and to June and July when you might be using a lot of air conditioning. Uh, next slide, please. And then that, that, that is a basic intro to how solar works. And I will be around later to answer any questions. Um, and then in terms of our advocacy projects that we've been working on in Virginia, um, we've been working on uh, currently getting shared solar, which is another term for community solar in APCO territory. And Dominion territory this year has shared solar coming online for the first time. So we're trying to get something like that um, in APCO territory, hopefully, you know, something better and that, um, you know, is more consumer friendly. Um, and then we're also working at the state legislature in terms of um, implementing consumer protection standards to protect customers from scams and from confusing or predatory sales tactics. Um, we've all probably heard of some solar scams, some of which aren't even solar companies. They're just people going door to door pretending to be solar companies. And then there are some solar companies that will you know, get someone to sign a contract and then cut and run. Um, so that's something that we're working on with the attorney general's office and with the legislature, just trying to get some standards so that everyone is hearing really good things about solar. Um, that's it for me. I will uh, turn it back over to you, Emma. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Roger. Jamie, we can go to the next slide. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm going to give a little bit more background about the Solar Worker of Southwest Virginia. That is a group of nonprofit and community action agencies, colleges, state agencies, and other interested citizens and businesses who are looking to develop a renewable energy industry cluster in the seven coal field counties of Southwest Virginia. So for folks who aren't from the coal fields, we're not talking about Blacksburg, we're not talking about Roanoke, we're talking the absolute corner of Virginia that has a coal mining history. The group is co-convened by UVA's College at Wise, Appalachian Voices and Peoples Incorporated. And we really have four goals for the area, installing solar, building up a workforce, uh, carrying out education and outreach regarding solar and renewable energy, and then promoting public policy that uh, will make solar more accessible for folks. Jamie, next slide. 
So moving on to sort of the nitty gritty financial policies, looking first at Virginia state policies, these are the three big ones. The first is the residential property tax exemption, which is new as of uh, January 2023. The idea behind this exemption is that installing solar panels causes your home value to increase, which is great if you're a homeowner, but that does also impact your property taxes. So this exemption means that residential and agricultural solar panel systems in Virginia are exempt from local and state uh, taxes. Then there's net metering, which Roger already touched on. Uh, Virginia investor-owned utilities, so looking mostly at Dominion and Appalachian Power, as well as some cooperatives are obligated to follow the state net metering laws. Participation is optional for smaller municipal utilities, um, but this is one of the primary ways that utility bills are lowered while ensuring that you always have power, and it can cover up to the full cost of your monthly utility bill. The final uh, mechanism is SREX, which stands for Solar Renewable Energy Credits. So in Virginia, utilities have to meet certain sustainability requirements, and they can do this by purchasing credits from folks who are producing solar energy. So as a residential owner who has a solar installation, you could sell your credits to the utilities, and then that money can help pay off your system costs a little bit more quickly. Uh, homeowners earn and sell the credits for every thousand kilowatt hours produced. And just as a reference, the average system will generate about 13 credits a year. Now, the value that you can send the that you can sell these at does change um, depending on policy initiatives, supply and demand. So the best way to get the most up-to-date price is to contact an SREC broker to discuss your options. The current price ceiling is $75 per credit, um, but that is the maximum price. So when we look at an average, we're looking more at $20 to $50 per credit. So if you have 13 credits per year, you're looking at between $260 and $650 annually. Next slide, Jamie. Moving into the highlights from the Inflation Reduction Act, this first slide focuses on some of the funding mechanisms, not for homeowners, but for folks who build residential properties and resources that they can tap into. So the Inflation Reduction Act was passed in 2022, and it contained just an incredible amount of funding for clean energy and home weatherization. So here are some of the most relevant modifications and new mechanisms. The first is the Low Income Solar and Wind Investment Tax Credit. This is a 10% bonus tax credit for solar and wind facilities that are placed in connection with low income communities. So while this isn't a direct funding mechanism for residential installations, it incentivizes solar in often overlooked areas. The next is the Energy Community Tax Credit Bonus. And this is a 10% bonus for production and investment tax credits for solar and other eligible energy projects and facilities in energy communities. So energy communities might be eligible because of recently closed coal mines, coal-fired power plants, uh, high levels of unemployment or a loss of tax revenue associated with the fossil fuel industry, et cetera. And this bonus can be stacked with other tax credits and bonuses. And the last one on this slide is the new energy efficient home credit. This will give builders up to $5,000 in tax credits for each new energy efficient home and up to 1,000 for each unit in a multifamily building. So the hope is that this will incentivize builders to lower monthly energy costs for future owners and renters. Next slide, Jamie. Thanks. And then we have incentives that are coming soon. So these are programs that were built into the IRA, but haven't actually been rolled out on the state level yet. The first is the High Efficiency Electric Home Rebate Program, uh, which is HERA. This is based on income and participating homes can receive up to $14,000 in rebates. There are caps for different types of energy efficiency modifications. So there's a cap of $8,000 for heat pumps, uh, 840 for an electric stove, 2,500 for wiring. But if you stack it correctly for your weatherization, you can get up to $14,000. The second is the Home Owner Managing Energy Savings Rebate Program or the HOMES program. And this aims to establish rebate programs for residential efficiency retrofit projects that would support whole house efficiency retrofits. Uh, the amount of these rebates would be determined by your estimated energy savings. 
And the hope is that these will be rolled out early 2024 for homeowners to tap into. And Evelyn, I will turn it over to you to talk about some more of the IRA incentives. Okay, I should be off of mute now. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, and, and Roger, I, I do want to say I like the idea of that solar um, happy hour uh, at Stakeholder Liaison. We may need to st steal that idea. But anyway, on the next slide, um, if you can move the slide, I'll just be giving a very light overview for the time talking about the home and residential energy credits. And you're free to go to the next slide. And as Emma mentioned, she mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act and all of the tax incentives or in, in incentivizing um, homeowners and others to make energy efficient improvements. And within the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, uh, there are two credits, great credits, that homeowners can claim um, on their taxes that will, again, incentivize them to make energy efficient home improvements. The two credits are the Energy Efficient Home Improvement Credit and the Residential Clean Energy Credit. And the great things about the great thing about these credits is they help you save to make these improvements. Three ways I like to say. One, it helps to reduce the cost of making these clean energy improvements on your home. Two, the cost savings continue month to month because once you've made these improvements, your energy cost will decrease. And three, saving energy is good for the environment. So there's several uh, bonuses in making these clean energy improvements. Now, those who homeowners can maximize uh, these credits, they will receive the best benefits. Uh, I will say it is important to make a plan um, because you have anywhere from 9, 10, 11, 12 years, depending, um, to make these credits um, and to claim these credits. So you don't have to panic and worry about trying to get everything done in one year. Plus, it won't necessarily benefit you as you as you uh, see. So I'll go over that, um, some of these credits. So would you um, go ahead and, and, and change? Now, one thing before I start talking about um, the individual credits, I do want to say that they are non-refundable. And what that means is these credits will only reduce a tax liability or eliminate it. But if there's any credit left after that tax liability is maybe eliminated, you won't get a refund for that. So again, uh, making a plan and working with your tax professional will be very important so that you can maximize uh, claiming these credits you know, year after year. There's a long time to make these improvements, very valuable. Now, the very first, the first one I want to talk about is the Energy Efficient Home Improvement Credit. This is a 30% credit, and there is a $1,200 annual limit. And there are several categories. So initially, we have the Qualified Energy Improvements uh, what we call the building envelope improvements. And I'll talk about that. But these are for in, um, installing exterior windows, doors, um, insulation. And next slide, I'll go through that. We have residential energy property expenditures and also the home energy audits, which are a great way for you to see um, how you can improve the energy efficiency of your home. But wait, it's not just a $1,200 annual limit you can get an additional $2,000 credit for installing heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, and biomass stoves and boilers. And this credit is allowed from January 2023 through January 1st of 2033. So there's time, make a plan. Um, let's see, okay, to make a plan um, to, to benefit from these credits. Now, if we'll look at the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the, the um, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, these are the categories that I mentioned just to highlight some of the improvements that you can make. I mentioned the building envelope. So you have exterior doors, exterior windows, skylights, insulation, and air sealing materials. 
Now, there are individual requirements because for these improvements, it just can't be any improvements. There'll be certain um, um, qualifications such as Energy Star. So your exterior doors need to be Energy Star, your exterior windows, and depending on the product, there'll be another um, qualification. And for the building envelope components, you may have individual um, caps. For example, exterior doors, you can allow, you're allow a credit of $250 per door, max two doors, that would be $500. So just for a very, very simple uh, example, maybe you'll uh, install two exterior doors in December and maybe complete uh, the rest of your exterior doors in the next year. That's what I'm talking about in making a plan and how you can improve, how you can maximize claiming these credits. The next category is your qualified energy property, your central air conditioner, natural um, gas, water heaters, furnaces, water boilers. Look, if you're a homeowner, Sometime within the next 10 years, something needs to be replaced. So make a plan for these energy efficient. We're talking 30% on these um, improvements credits. Then you have your qualified energy property. That's where you can get that additional $2,000 credit. And then your home energy credits up to $150 for a qualified auditor to come in and show you how you can improve the energy efficiency in your home. Now, if you go to the next slide, uh, this is just a, a really nice visual that shows you how your potential credit can be $3,200. There's that $1,200 maximum for your building envelope components for your residential energy property. And that, um, that home energy audit is included in that maximum credit. And then you can also get an additional $2,000 maximum credit for heat pumps, heat pump heaters, biomass stoves, et cetera. Now, I know this is a lot of information. I do want to say um, irs.gov has lots of information, including really good FAQs, which will give you some examples, especially when I was talking about the individual requirements in the case of the $1,200 maximum. So we're here to answer your questions and also irs.gov or invite us back. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Now, I talked about the second credit, which is the residential clean energy credit. Now, this credit is worth 30% for certain qualified expenditures. This credit has no limitations. Um, your fuel cells has, have a little, but 30%. And I do want to say um, there's no lifetime limit. Anybody who's familiar with this, there used to be a $500 lifetime limit. There's no lifetime limit on the credits. That's what uh, the Inflation Reduction Act did for us. So IRA, I, the IRA extended the residential clean energy credit. They also added battery storage technology. This credit is good for property placed in service from 2021 before January 2035. Now, in this situation, the credit will phase down. It's still a great credit. First, you have 30 percent. But you'll see on the chart in 2033 uh, drops to 26 percent. And then in 2034, it drops to 22 percent. Still great, um, a great amount of credit to reduce your tax liability. Um, now, if we go to the next slide, it will highlight um, the, the type of improvements or property that are available for the residential clean, for the residential energy credit. Solar electric property expenditures. This is Rogers area, solar panels. We have solar heating property expenditures at solar uh, water heaters, fuel cell expenditures, um, wind turbines, geothermal heat pump property expenditures, and battery storage expenditures. Um, right there, it talks about um, a little uh, what qualifies for your fuel cell property a maximum credit of 500 for each half kilowatt watt of capacity. That's a mouthful for me. Um, let's see what I want to talk want to talk about on the next slide. 
these charts are, are just a visual, um, again, showing the equipment type and the type of the cost included that I, I won't go over this today, but um, I think Emma is handing this out when I talked about the various categories. You'll have those charts available for you to see the various categories and any limit, limits, and it will also show you the qualifications, uh, the qualification for solar panels or um, things like um, the, the doors or the windows, Energy Star. You just you want to plan and you want to make sure that these are qualified energy property. That's key in claiming these credits. Okay, let's see what I have on the next slide. Um, here's some more energy efficient requirements, what I was just talking about. So for your solar water heating property, it needs the solar rating certification um, or a comparable energy, uh, comparable entity. Your geothermal heat pump property, the Energy Star program. And let's look at the next slide. Now, here's some additional information in regard to the energy credits. I already talked about how they're non refundable. Um, this has to be new property, used property is not eligible. So make sure that exterior door is brand new. Labor costs vary for your building envelope improvements, the labor costs are not figured in with that credit, but for the other properties, yes, it is. Um, and we have FAQs that kind of give you a little more information about that. And um, some of what Emma was talking about, maybe not e exactly, but um, now's the time where you may almost stack up all of these benefits. The government may come in with uh, various subsidies or rebates. If you have a public utility uh, subsidy, in this case, you would reduce um, your improvements by the amount of the subsidy, and then you claim the credit based on the remainder. If you have any rebates, you'll reduce the cost by the rebates. If there are any state energy incentives, there's no action you have to take. So again, just lots of benefits encourage you to go to your um, state or public website, energy websites to see what they offer. That's some of what um, Emma uh, may have been talking about a little earlier. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, timing. Um, for the credits, you claim you're eligible to claim the credit in the year the property is installed. So let's say you purchase um, property in December, but it isn't installed until January. Well, that year in January is when you will claim the credit. Your building envelope uh, components, they're expected to remain about five years. Again, I did mention this earlier, there's no lifetime limit on the credits. Now, I talked about um, these credits are non-refundable. They can reduce the tax liability or eliminate it. But what if there's credit left over? For your energy efficient home improvement credit, uh, that's it. Um, it it's, it's, it's extinguished. But for your residential clean energy property credit, you can carry um, any credit that's remaining after you've reduced your tax liability you can carry that over to the next year. Um, I will, can we go to the next slide? Uh, before we have questions, I just want to touch on a few other items. Um, these are homes in the USA. These are homes that are your uh, primary residence, um, new systems not used. And that's a quick uh, a quick overview, but um, I'm here and my team is here and we will be ready for your questions. And if there are any questions we can't um, answer just today, we will definitely take them down and research them and get back with you. So Emma, I think I made it in my time. I'll turn it back over to whoever will um, handle the question, the Q&A section. Thank you for having us. Great, thank you so much, Evelyn. And I can see Richard is already answering some of the questions. Awesome. Uh, we know that that was a lot of information to throw at you. So yes, this is recorded and the recording will be made available. And when you get the recording along with the PowerPoint, there are additional slides at the end of it that we haven't gone over, but that contain additional information for you. 
So we've gotten a lot of really great questions and I'm just going to start asking these in the order that they came in. So the first question said, do some customers ask for a system that will be more resilient to storms or hurricanes? And if so, how much does that increase the cost of the system components, labor and insurance? So I'm not sure who wants to take that question. Roger has it. Okay. Um, so most places, people just uh, aim for what the building code says. Um, also, they're really cool. If you ever have some extra time on your hands, they're really cool YouTube videos of people shooting hail at solar panels, because that's one of the requirements is that you know, every solar panel needs to be able to survive, you know, a one inch piece of hail coming down at 50 miles an hour. So there are people at all these fun test labs, um, you know, at universities and at the National Renewable Energy Lab in Colorado, just shoot, shooting the hail at the solar panels. Um, but yeah, like in Florida, there are specific brands of solar panels that need that have the qualifications to be installed near the coast because of hurricanes. Um, but, you know, as long as you're using a qualified, reputable installer, and I definitely ask for references and ask your neighbors who they've used, but th they should know all of that. Um, so you can always, you know, go one, one step up. But generally, we see that, right, if you're in a area that is prone to getting hurricanes, you'll make sure to have the equipment that's um, suited for it. It's usually not really more expensive. Um, sometimes it'll be a little bit more. But um, it, it's mostly just knowing which brands can be used in, in different places. And in terms of inverters and batteries, the, those all pretty much work everywhere. And then just, uh, you know, each state and each municipality has their own insurance requirements. So for example, in Virginia, a lot of people make sure to have a system that's uh, under a certain size so they don't, have, they don't get hit with needing to have like a million dollar insurance policy, which is required for a certain size system in Dominion territory. Um, but I, I'm not sure of the exact requirements, so I definitely check, you know, with your utility on it. Thanks. Thanks, Roger. So we've gotten a few questions asking about the process for accessing these energy credits and rebates. We have a couple from folks who represent nonprofits or religious entities that don't necessarily file a tax return. So if there could be just a quick guide on how do you actually go about tapping into these resources? Why don't I uh, give that question a shot, Emma? This is Richard Furlong, uh, Evelyn's colleague in the IRS. And I did see a question come in on uh, nonprofits and, and government entities. So they generally, uh, by definition, don't pay federal taxes. So a, a credit, a tax credit, doesn't and because it's non-refundable, as Evelyn described, you would think it would not help them. However, built into the details of the Inflation Reduction Act, the uh, the legislation provides that tax exempt and government entities who are generally unable to use tax credits may now benefit from clean energy tax credits by using some new options in the Inflation Reduction Act. And this is what is called, and you'll see articles, and you'll see them increasing in coming months from the IRS. The provision is called the elective pay provision, which basically makes these credits that would normally not be refundable to the nonprofits and the government entities actually refundable through a special process that's being developed that would be part of the tax return uh, that the, the tax exempt organization, let's say what we know as a 501c3 charitable organization or a state or local government would file with the Internal Revenue Service. Now, this is only in the early stages of building out, and this probably Emma, might be a topic for an in-depth discussion early next year when Evelyn and I and our colleagues have more information. I do know that these the these um, the governments and the tax exempts will have to register through a portal that is not yet available, and then they'll pro provide some paperwork, probably in the form of a tax filing form, to get essentially a check 
from the Treasury Department once the IRS processes that claim. But we're not there yet. But it is something that will help incentivize the production uh, of certain types of energy production that are deemed clean energy. Uh, and there are a host of them in the IRA that will help nonprofits and state and local governments to invest in those projects. So stay tuned on that. So that's really focusing not on the individuals. As Evelyn was discussing tonight, our credits tonight being discussed are on the individual side, but there will be much more coming forward with credits on the production side. And then one final point, aside from the elective pay provision, for-profit entities that are investing in clean energy projects of various sorts, they will be able through a portal under development to transfer those credits to non-related entities. In other words, the marketplace is envisioned as, as rolling out over the next decade that will allow for the transfer of producer credits as enacted under the Inflation Reduction Act to third parties. So company A, who might not for various technical reasons need the credit, transfer it to company B, and then company A would get a check. Now that a lot has to be built in to ensure the integrity of that system, but both for nonprofits, uh, state and local governments, and for-profit businesses, you'll be hearing much more about these direct pay and transferability provisions under the IRA next year, Emma. So I hope that it, it's very easy to get too deep into the weeds with taxes quickly, but I hope that was at least a teaser of what's to come. Yes, thank you, Richard. That was very helpful. And I think the next question, or it was a group of questions, is slightly related, um, thinking about transferable credits. People have asked, what is the incentive for low-income folks who have little to no taxes to pay because they can't actually tap into any credits? So what resources are out there? What financial incentives are out there to help pay for weatherization in those cases? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go on the firing line first. And, and at least from the tax side, the, the, the questioner is... is correct that for low income folks who don't have a tax liability on their form 1040, a non-refundable credit, as Evelyn mentioned, these are all non-refundable credits. They do not provide value to that taxpayer who might not even have a requirement to file a tax return if their income was extremely low. And that's different than credits that came up during COVID-19, such as a expanded child tax credit for one year, uh, where families could get back up to $3,000 per child. And then there's the earned income tax credit for low-income folks that has been around for decades, where folks who, who are eligible for the EITC, but have a tax liability below that credit, they'll get a refund of the different. But the IRA does not provide for those provisions. So for that reason, what I'm looking at, because we do want lower income folks to have affordable housing that uses clean energy, that uh, uh, consumes less electricity than it might otherwise, then we're looking at some of these credits for the builders and possibly the rebate programs you mentioned, Emma. I don't wanna speak for West Virginia or any other state, but we're aware that many states are incentivizing certain purchases, I believe, through rebates. So that would be outside the tax arena, outside the IRS. All right, awesome. Let's see, moving on through some of the other questions. Can any of these credits be used for things that were already purchased, like windows, water heaters, et cetera? Okay, I, I didn't know if Richard was going to ask that. Um, she didn't necessarily say what year. Uh, in 2022, a smaller credit, maybe of 10%, um, with a maximum limitation of $500, 
maybe those purchases qualified if they meet uh, met the requirements. So if that is the year that they were installed, um, she may want to um, check that out. But if, again, you claim the credit in the year that it is installed, so you want to look at uh, what credits were available, what energy credits, and um, it, it's code section, we, we don't want to get into that, but what were the credits allowed for the time period or the year when they were installed. So I mentioned that um, the IRA expanded and amended um, these credits. Uh, for instance, it was previously called the non-business uh, credit. So if it was 2022 um, and uh, these are qualified energy um, improvements and depending on what improvements they were, you may be able to claim um, a, a credit. Maybe not um, the energy efficient home improvement credit or the residential um, uh, credit that we mentioned today at that percent, but it depends on when purchased and when installed. Um, maybe 10%, depending on what it was, what property. Uh, you'll notice that this year under these credits that the roof, uh, roofs are no longer allowed. So um, you, you might want to take a look at what the tax law uh, regarding those non-business credits uh, allowed in the year that you install those, those energy uh, products. Did I miss anything, uh, Richard or Al, on that? No, no, I think you you covered it. It, it you know, as as Ellen indicated, two thousand twenty three is not the first year for the energy efficient home improvement credit. There was that smaller credit dating back fifteen years uh, that Congress passed. It was capped at five hundred dollars, okay. and it was what they called a lifetime credit. So once you got that five hundred on one or more tax returns, tax credit you weren't eligible for anything more. And then the IRA moving forward over the next decade significantly enhanced it again for those who are making improvements to their main home uh, or their second home. Uh, and for, but it has to be an existing home. I think the policy for not allowing, because one of the questions came in about adding uh, Energy Star windows or doors to a new home being built, that is not allowed for the consumer's energy credit. But the thinking is maybe the home builders who meet the requirements will build that new home in a energy efficient, clean energy fashion. Uh, so they'll get the credit and pass on the savings to the consumer. So it, it's both looking at the producer side and looking at the consumer side. And there are different credits for each. And, and Richard, you did answer in the chat that while the, the items such as the windows and the doors, uh, a credit isn't available if it's a new build or uh, if you um, constructed that home. However, under the residential credit, uh, those would be allowable. And he addressed that. Oh, my lights went out, excuse me. <laughs> uh, he addressed that in um, the credit, in the webinar chat. Yeah, and that, that, uh, thanks for reminding me because Roger's focus was on the solar panels. And I think that's where, where the, the Congress hopes that the IRA will incentivize solar panels because that 30% credit, uh, uh, which could be on a new home for solar panels, is available to anyone. And solar panels, as we know, unfortunately, still are, and Roger, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, pretty expensive. So by getting a 30% credit, which is significant on an outlay, it will incentivize, the thinking is, um, over the next decade, many, many more homes, both new and existing, to put solar panels on those homes. I see you nodding, Roger. Yeah, yeah, that that that's that's absolutely right. I mean, it, yeah, it, it's very helpful. And obviously, you know, one of the big issues, as people have pointed out, 
is that if you can't take the tax credit, um, you know, that that's, uh, you know, as you talked about, that's also a big issue. Um, you know, and that's, that's the reason there are a lot of, um, you know, nonprofits working on this issue specifically, and also doing all, all different sorts of things like, you know, solar leases or power purchase agreements as well. Right. And um, I and I'm noticing um, the questions coming in about the nonprofits and the low income. So I see future opportunities because uh, because Richard talked about that electric um, elect to pay. Some of this is still rolling out, and we're still getting information. But I see future opportunities. Um, hopefully, everyone uh, attending here will, will stay plugged in uh, with Emma for us to come back in the future with more information as as this um, rolls out. And um, wouldn't you agree, Richard, on that? We, we just don't have full information on some of these, but uh, definitely I've written some notes and hope that we may get an opportunity to come back and uh, maybe address some of these more fully as the information and everything is built up and, and we receive more guidance. And that, you know, that I agree fully. Uh, also, a point was made earlier about um, the, as you know, as as businesses, large and small, are selling new doors, new windows, home improvements. Unfortunately, there may be some small. We hope small number, very small number of bad actors out there misrepresenting the credits. And if you see or hear from your constituents or your members any marketing ads that look too good to be true, if you share them with us, we, uh, we will be continuing the messaging and we will ramp it up during tax season when many, many more Americans are focusing on taxes because we're concerned that if a salesperson looking to close a sale makes promises, and I, I think a good example is someone at the lower in, income scale uh, who might be thinking that they get a great credit when they go to their tax preparer and they find out, even though they have the documentation, they're not necessarily going to get any immediate tax benefit. There's certainly, we hope it will help winterize their home, improve the energy efficiency, but we're also concerned and we will address through our, our outreach and communications, uh, consumer awareness of these tax benefits. So anything you're seeing in, in your neighborhoods uh, that strike you as over-promising the credits, please let Evelyn and I know about them. Not that we're going to go out and knock on their door, but we can get us a, we're, a complete sidebar. We're seeing a lot of problems with a employer credit that's been out there where there are promoters targeting small businesses saying you can get thousands of dollars back from the IRS based on the number of your employees. And there's a lot of misrepresentation. Anytime there's a, a new new tax incentive out there there will be some individuals, either they don't fully understand the rules, which can be very technical, or they're misrepresenting the tax rules for their own purposes. Thank you, Richard. And I can see in the questions that Roger has been a lean, mean question answering machine. But Roger, I was wondering if you could speak a little more about uh, resources or a possible database that folks can go to to get contact information for reputable clean energy uh, installers or contractors? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so I just uh, dropped in the chat, you know, feel free to go to our website and we have a, we have a solar help desk. It's solarunitedneighbors.org slash help desk. And we have uh, three people on my team that that's their full-time job is just helping people answer questions about going solar and they're happy to help do research uh, for you in your area. Um, we, we run a lot of solar co-ops and a lot of solarized campaigns end up knowing a lot of good local companies. Um, the biggest resource nationally that most people use and 
you know, I'm not affiliated with them, but is Energy Sage. If you haven't heard of them, they're, they're a website that helps you find installers in your area. Um, we, we are vendor neutral. So what we try and do is not promote, um, you know, any certain solar company by any means, but really just make sure that people are finding out what works for them. So we, we definitely just recommend in the same way that, you know, Richard was talking about with all the solar scams, just doing your homework, asking neighbors, um, checking references, making sure that people have worked in your area before. A lot of the time we'll see that someone will be offering really low prices. And let's say the installer is based in Texas, but the customer is based in North Carolina and the company in Texas has never done permitting in North Carolina before. And all of a sudden they'll get there and say, oh, wait, we actually can't offer this low price. We, we have no idea how much a solar permit costs in this county. So for us, a lot of it really is just, just you know, double checking, checking references, checking online reviews, um, you know, and also asking the company, you know, for contact information in your, in your local area. But also like we offer this free service. We're happy to, um, you know, if you have three or four solar uh, proposals and you want to find out, you know, are they reputable, you know, feel free to send, the, send them um, our way. And also in any of our states, we're happy to connect you to, to the local staff there as well. All right. Thank you, Roger. I think with that, we have worked our way through most of the questions. If you have a question that hasn't been answered yet, you can look in the, the bar at the bottom of your screen and raise your hand. And that will just notify us and we can make sure we're not missing anybody. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. So again, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, thank you to Roger and to Evelyn and Richard for putting their effort into this and uh, helping us all understand Seller a little bit more. And like I said, this has been recorded, so we will be sending out the recording and the slides uh, probably sometime early next week so you guys can have these for a reference. And my email and Roger's email are both in the chat if you have any follow-ups. All right, and I think we can close out now. Hope everybody has a good evening. Thanks everyone.